recording the meeting. Okay, so my name is Kim Park Nelson. I'm a Korean American adoptee and an adoption researcher and a professor of ethnic studies at Winona State University. Um, so uh, just to sort of like lay some context here, um, Korean adoption has been ongoing since the Korean War, um, or since the Korean War ended with the armistice in 19, 1953. And we estimate in that time, there are over 200,000 Korean adoptees worldwide with over half of those people adopted into the United States. Korea's overseas adoption program is the longest running program in the world because it's more or less been going on continuously since that time, since 1953. Today, we are really psyched to focus on the specific experiences of black Korean adoptees. And we're very fortunate to have several experts in the house today. So I think you're everybody who's here, I think we're all in for a treat. But before we get to that, I'm delighted to introduce Chris Hastings. Chris Hastings is executive producer at the World Channel, which created America Reframed. Um, Geographies of Kinship will, will be airing this Thursday on PBS stations and online on America Reframed. Chris, take it away. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and thank you all for allowing me to join this space. I am overwhelmed by so many faces that I see here tonight. Um, as Kim said, I am executive producer of America Reframed. Uh, at, w, at WGBH um, in Boston. Um, so let me give you a little context about America Reframe. It is a documentary show that we started about 10 years ago with a mission to share the many stories of a transforming and diverse America. Uh, we did it 10 years ago with the understanding that we wanted to do something different uh, using public media's platforms to share stories that aren't being told uh, as often as we could. Um, and then quite frankly, to be an enhancement to what public media is doing, supposed to do on, on ongoing. Uh, America Frame now in its 10th year has shared uh, well over 150 stories from filmmakers like Deanne, who uh, for those of you who don't know is an amazing director and I've probably never told her this before, but I'm a huge fan of Deanne's work. Um, so when she asked me to come and give an intro, I was a little bit giddy and a little bit scared uh, because she is a master storyteller. Um, and Deanne, in particular, uh, tells story from her, perspec her, her perspective, um, her history. Uh, and it's the exact kind of film that we've wanted to share on America Frame and through the PBS system. Uh, so I am was so honored that we got an opportunity to present Geographies of Kinship, which we all are going to be talking about tonight. Um, I'm so honored that uh, I'm going to get to meet uh, so many of you uh, as we bring this film to the PBS system and to World Channel this Thursday at 8 p.m. Uh, and just so a little plug about this, uh, it's going to broadcast on World Channel. Uh, for those of you who are in the U.S., um, if you don't get World Channel in your market, it will be streaming in the PBS at, at 8 p.m. on Thursday. Um, and, and as we work with you, and every, every relationship with a filmmaker is a partnership. And I'm so grateful that after 10 years that we continue to get to work with Deanne and bring this new film uh, of her collection of films to the PBS system. So I'm going to uh, give it back to Kim. Um, as I try to uh, sit back and listen to this conversation and maybe participate. And I am so thankful to you all for allowing me to be here to hear your stories. Kim, back to you. Thank you so much, Chris. So next, I'd like to introduce Deanne Borchelim. She is one of my favorite people on earth and also the director of the film Geographies of Kinship. Um, Deanne Borchelim is a Korean adoptee and the director of the film we're discussing tonight's Geographies of Kinship, as well as several other documentaries, including two others focused on Korean adoption, first person plural, and in a matter of Cha Jung Hee. Deanne? Thank Thanks, you. Kim. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Hello, everybody. Oh my God, it's so great to be here with you all. Um, I'm tuning in from Berkeley, California which sits on the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo Ohlone. I'm a Korean woman with short 
salt and pepper hair, grayer because of all the filmmaking I've been doing recently, <laughs> and um, also uh, wearing a maroon shirt. Um, I just want to take a moment just to acknowledge this amazing, beautiful community here um, this evening and express my gratitude to all of you for your interest and support. I'm a firm believer in building community through sharing our collective history. And I hope this event opens up our curiosity for further learning about some of the topics that we'll be um, discussing tonight. Um, I'd like to just thank all the co-sponsoring organizations. We have 12 different groups representing adopted people throughout the United States and around the world joining tonight. And of course, also to um, thanks to World Channel, America Reframed, Center for Asian American Media, and me and Korea for jointly um, hosting this event. So Geographies of Kinship um, tells the story of four adopted individuals who returned to Korea in search of the personal histories that were essentially erased when they were um, adopted. And in many ways, um, their stories mirror the journeys of many of us here, um, the journeys that we've undertaken or are undertaking, um, journeys of search, unexpected discoveries, um, sometimes dead ends or um, mysteries that uh, may never be resolved or that may take many decades to resolve. Um, rather than focusing solely on the personal stories, the film actually sets these four individual stories within a broader historical context, beginning with the Korean War and taking us through South Korea's post-war um, industrialization and modernization, and then the eventual adoption of um, approximately 200,000 Korean children uh, worldwide. Um, so for people who have not seen the film, I'd like to just briefly share the trailer. It's, um, it's a short trailer, and then I'll come back um, to say a few more words. I had no name, only the date when I was abandoned. I didn't look like my mother. I didn't look like my father. I didn't look like my brothers. The other kids would always think that I was Chinese. Our parents told us we were orphans, that we didn't have any parents. I knew I was Korean, but I didn't know what that meant. The Korean War left thousands of children orphaned. The image in Western countries was that there's a continuous supply of Korean orphans. If you're the illegitimate offspring of a Korean woman, you have no place. As far as the law was concerned, you didn't exist. As the adoption rates from Korea hit their peak in the mid 80s, the majority of them were from single mothers. My American parents were told they were getting orphans. But when I started to ask questions about my adoption, my mom just got up and she walked away. <laughs> Many adoptees want to know what happened and how did it happen. Yeah, mom is looking in the mirror. I feel very close with my family here, but I have this loss and also I have this curiosity. I think it speaks volumes about us as humans, how we always want to go back. It's a journey where I started to learn who am I. So, um, so that's the trailer. I hope you'll all tune in on May 19th. That's my plug. It's actually 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time. So um, hope you tune in. Um, I'll just close by saying that um, it's just been a great privilege to make this film. It's taken many years with um, a lot of support from a lot of you here tonight. Um, and um, it's just been incredible to bear witness to the journeys of the adopted individuals whose stories are featured in the film, um, including Estelle cook Sampson, who's here with us tonight. And it's actually through my continuing connection to Estelle that I met Lisa Jackson, who's also on the panel today and started documenting her amazing story for a new film that's currently in development. Mm -hmm. So I'm just um, really thrilled that both Lisa and Estelle are here to share their experiences and to be in dialogue with Professor Corey Graves, 
whose research sheds light on the early years of African-American adoption of Korean children. Um, I know that for me, delving deeper into this history has really reoriented how I think about Korean transnational adoption. It's really broadened my lens to consider our collective history, not only in light of the Korean War, but also the Cold War, the civil rights movement, African-American history, and US military involvements around the world. Um, so I hope tonight's conversation will leave us all with much to think about and that we'll have an opportunity to gather again um, in the near, near future. So thank you again for joining us tonight and I hope you enjoy the, uh, the conversation. Thank you so much, Deanne. Um, Deanne, you're an incredible filmmaker and the work that you've, the work that, that you, you've done has meant so much to the adoptee community. I'm now gonna introduce our three panelists. Um, and I think that I'm gonna go in the order of that I'm gonna be asking you questions in. So um, Estelle, I'm gonna start with you. Dr. Estelle Cook Sampson is a black Korean adoptee born in Pusan during the Korean War and adopted by an African-American serviceman and his family in 1958 when she was approximately six or seven years old. Her story is featured in Geographies of Kinship. Hi, Lisa yeah, Jackson. Hi, Lisa Jackson is you. a Black Korean adoptee born in 1962 sure. in Wijangbu, South Korea. When she was six years old, she and another mixed race Korean girl were selected for, an adopt for adoption by an African American serviceman who was stationed at, at a nearby American military base. Last but not least, Dr. Corey Graves is an associate professor of history at SUNY Albany. Her book, A War Born Family, African American Adoption in the Wake of the Korean War, is a historical exploration, exploration of African-American Korean adoption. So Estelle, I'm gonna start with my first question for you. You were adopted by an African-American soldier stationed in Korea during the Korean War, as I just, as I just uh, uh, stated in your introduction. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share the story of what led to your adoption and how you met your American father. Okay. Thank you so much, Kim. And I would like to thank all of the participants as well as all of the guests. And uh, it brings me great joy to be able to be at this point in my life to be able to um, have an open discussion with a larger community as to a very critical time of American history that most people have forgotten, similar to the way we think of the uh, forgotten war of Korea. But, um, and I really want to thank Deanne because she's been plugging with me for the last almost 14 years in the making of this uh, film. Um, I was, uh, um, as a little child, I can remember being in a, a smaller orphanage and then eventually made my way to the larger orphanage, which was in uh, Mingdong, which is, which is located behind the National Cathedral. It is the National Cathedral in Seoul, Korea. Um, I remember entering that orphanage right around Christmas time. And I look back, it actually occurred the 28th of December. I remember um, stockings on the wall, Christmas stockings, which we were not allowed to touch. Uh, living pretty much a solitude life there in the orphanage on the first floor, uh, not having a name, not engaging in any activities with other children, just pretty much an uh, isolated life. And one spring day, I remember soldiers coming to this orphanage and they came to see probably the fan dance, which was occurring on the second floor. Uh, the, um, there was an auditorium and I had never been to this auditorium, but anyway, we were allowed to go uh, march to the auditorium. And I remember after the uh, performance, I don't know how many soldiers, there weren't that many, uh, maybe perhaps 20, I have no idea, I can't really remember. This African-American soldier asked me to sit on his lap and he gave me a package of gum, which was Wrigley's gum. I remember the green package. And I couldn't speak any English. I couldn't speak any Korean. I couldn't speak anything. I was just, just like, you know, just doing nothing uh, pretty much. 
And uh, then after that, he then would come to the orphanage and would take me out on the weekends. Before Thanksgiving, I was allowed to move uh, with him onto the base, which was very unusual because they had no civilians living on the post. And so I think my father was pretty courageous to ask permission to bring this child on post. And I basically lived in the barracks with, with him and the other soldiers. And by spring, I guess he had completed all the adoption papers. And by June, I was, you know, I was on the airplane and my entry to the States was via Honolulu. So I don't know, I don't know what organization I went through. There was very, the records were very sparse. And I later found out that that particular orphanage was not an orphanage for adoption. It was really for undesirable children. Estelle, thanks so much for sharing your story with us tonight and also, of course, in the film. Um, my next question is for Lisa Jackson. Lisa, um, you lived with your Korean birth mother in Wijangbu for almost six years before being adopted by an African-American serviceman. Can you tell us a little bit about what your life was like living with your Korean mother and also what led to your adoption? Uh, yes. And good evening, and I'm um, very thankful and honored to be here this evening. Um, thankful to all the, the sponsors, thankful to Deanne who has just uh, been amazing. Um, thankful to my family who are um, on this um, broadcast with us um, and always constantly supporting me. Um, so uh, yes, um, I lived with my mother um, for at least uh, six years. Um, I really think that my mother wanted to try to keep me, but things were really difficult. Um, my life growing up, um, I remember just having the community of, um, of our little friends in our little, in our little village, just a close knit group of of people that, um, that of kids that I used to play with. And, um, and my life was pretty ordinary. Um, I think though, as a child, you don't understand some of the, the, um, the things that people say, um, I don't think you understand um, the, what's going on in the world. You just see your little, little part of, of of your life. And so um, uh, I have since learned that, you know, my mother did all that she could, but because of the constant racism and, um, and different difficulties that she had to go through, my family had to go through, um, that's when she decided to go ahead and relinquish me. Um, and I, I was sent to, um, um, Korean Social Services, that's an orphanage in Korea, in Seoul. And, um, and of course, just like Estelle said, the military soldiers used to visit the orphanages. I guess that was sort of their way of giving back to the community. And um, that's how I met my father. Um, originally it was just me. And I have since found out that he wanted to have two little girls and so, but originally it was just me and he came and the same thing, um, it, uh, he would give us candy and chewing gum. I guess that was the thing back in, in 1969. Um, and it was juicy fruit to this day. I can just remember how juicy fruit tastes because it was so good coming from him. He was very kind. Um, he would be able to take, take me out on walks um, I guess that was kind of the orphanage's way of kind of letting us get to know him. Um, but my adopted parents wanted two little girls. And so about a month later, my sister, who was not blood related to me, but another little Korean girl was, um, was um, uh, she came into the picture. Uh, I wanted him for myself because 
that's what I wanted, but, uh, <laughs> but um, my sister, uh, who I love very much um, now is, um, they adopted the both of us. And so it took some time, that was 1968. And we came to the US in 1969. And, um, and during that time, we were able to have, um, uh, I was still able to see my mother from time to time. Um, I think she wanted that close relationship. And as a matter of fact, it was my mother who took me um, to the airplane, walked me up the stairs and let me go. And I have, I have since gotten that picture of the last picture that we took together at the airport. So. Wow, Lisa, that is such a powerful story. And I, I can't wait to hear more about both of your stories um, a little bit later. But now I wanna turn to Corey. Um, Corey, you and I have known each other since graduate school because we were both studying Korean adoption. And I'm so delighted yeah. to be in conversation with you here tonight. And I'm wondering, so we've just heard kind of the, you know, the initial stories from, um, from our two Black adoptee, Korean adoptee mm -hmm. panelists. And I am wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and your work and how you became interested in Black Korean adoption history as a research focus. Thank you, yes. And I have to echo what my fellow panelists have said. It is an honor to be a part of this conversation. Deanne, thank you so much for this work and for asking us to be a part of it. Thank you to the sponsors and uh, thank you, Kim. It is wonderful to see you. My work began out of questions I had about African-American families in the 1950s and 1960s. I'm not an adoptee. So I came to this work truly almost by accident. I was looking for stories about African-American families to answer questions about the time period when black families were being demonized as dysfunctional. Things like government reports, Moynihan report, um, infamously the Daniel Patrick Moynihan report that we have sort of truncated into a discussion about the ways that African-American mothers in particular were seen as dangerous matriarchs and black families were in jeopardy because of the absence of strong black fathers. So that construct bothered me and I was curious about how African-American communities responded. I made my way to the black press, which is uh, one of the richest sources of information about African-American life, dating back to when we first uh, see these African-American newspapers in the 19th century. I started in popular magazines looking at magazines like Ebony and Jet, Sepia, Our World, for a cultural response. And as I was going through those magazines, I found over and over again, stories about African-Americans who were adopting children from European nations as a part of the post-World War II recovery from Japan, and then Korea. And these stories felt out of context for me because I had never heard them. I didn't know anything about African-American families adopting. And I often say to people, one of the first questions I was asked whenever I went to do this research was, black people adopt? So part of the project was really about a recovery of stories about African-American families, but it quickly developed into a project that was interested in answering, I, I'm always moved by the opening that Deanne showed us because that statement that Estelle makes about just wanting to know what happened, that is the comment that I've heard from Korean Black adoptees. And that's what the work became about, talking about what happened to create a situation where Korean children were the, the largest wave of, of adoptees out of Korea and that Korean Black children as a part of it were not discussed in much of the scholarship that talked about that really phenomenal development. So that's how I came to the project. And one of the things that I discovered pretty quickly 
was that African Americans had a very sustained conversation about the role that they should play in adopting children, the children of war, children displaced by war, whose fathers were African American. But their adoptions didn't begin there. Many of the Korean uh, soldiers in Korea, um, uh, both these stories sound so familiar because in all of the reading that I've done, what I saw were black soldiers finding ways to support children in Japan, in European nations, and in Korea. So starting orphanages, taking up collections, giving candy, those were just some of the more immediate ways that they were addressing and responding to what they saw as children who needed care. And that developed for many into adoptions, adoptions of children in Korea. The first story that I talk about in the, in the book when I talk about these adoptions is of the soldier who adopted a child who wasn't Korean black. He likely had a Caucasian father, um, but he was a mixed race Korean child. So those stories became the central focus of the work that I felt I needed to do to answer the question, what happened? If I can just follow up with you, um, the, the work that you, the work that you've been doing on on Korean adoption, particularly the experience of African American Korean adoptees, is so fascinating. And I'm I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about where sort of um, the adoption stories of the other mixed race, like the you mentioned that there was this uh, that this the first child was that you think that was adopted was actually mm -hmm. probably had a white father, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about sort of both the the crot like the intersections in those histories, but also the divergences, because you know I'm I'm very happy that we're kind of focusing on the Black Korean adoptee experience tonight. But I think that, mm -hmm. and I, one of the reasons I'm so happy about it is because I think it's something that isn't really discussed very often, right. exactly. very much. And so I also feel like you know, and also because the time period this took place in, that there were there's some there's also some splits, right, to keep these populations separate. And so. Yes. Um, can you just briefly talk about kind of that shared and also divergent history? Certainly. One of the first things that I found in the record were that the U.S. military's goal was to reduce and, and really not even just reduce, but to eliminate opportunities for African-American soldiers to fraternize, especially with women in European nations. The efforts involved sort of moving these men around. And one of the patterns that I saw was that they didn't want black men in European nations where they might fraternize with, develop relationships with, have children and marry, um, legitimize relationships with women in European nations. And so they deliberately sent them to Asian nations and, and sort of in a way showing that there was a racial and gender hierarchy that the military attempted to not only um, sort of create, but protect. So African-American soldiers, and this comes through in Deanne's work, one of the ways that there is a true convergence is that African-American men, and this will come through in the stories that you hear later, potentially father children in European nations, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam as the US military moved these men from place to place to place. But much of the goal was to reduce, uh, for many reasons, to reduce any kind of um, opportunities for marriages, for the creation of families, and these mixed race populations that would create questions about identity, belonging, citizenship. So the history is fraught because on the one hand, we have the evidence, the stories of men who attempted to marry wives, bring uh, their families to the United States, but efforts both by the US government, but also as a product of US immigration policy that limited the potential for these kinds of family development. Adoptions though still took place. 
And the goal of most of the adoption agencies were to police lines of race as efficiently as they could. And the way they did that was by rather quickly determining that the racial identity that mattered for these adoptees was that of their biological father. So for children whose fathers were African-American, the goal initially was that they would be adopted by African-American families in the United States. Many of these soldiers though were stationed in Japan. So this, the, where they actually live with their adoptive families uh, actually develops uh, in, in a little bit of an unpredictable pattern. But the second part of that story is that the children fathered by white soldiers were to be adopted by white families. So it created that uh, sort of, a, and we think about two tiers uh, sometimes in other social policies. This is a really kind of tiered adoption goal, um, not sort of, not fully embraced as a sort of policy, but definitely the practice of most adoption agencies. Corey, thank you so much for giving us some context, for giving us some context. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, <laughs> just making sure. Thank you so much for giving us some context about the, the stories that we're hearing tonight. Um, I'm going to I'm going to turn back to Estelle and Lisa. I have a question for the both of you um, that I'm hoping you can um, that you can answer for us. Uh, so here's the question. So most Korean adoptees are adopted into white homes, and Corey has just explained to us why that was. Um, so many of us who experience many of us who were adopted into white homes experience. Um, uh, experience being the only person of color in all white spaces. Um, I think that's a very common, it's a very common experience for, for Korean adoptees who are adopted into white homes. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you experience your mixed race identity in the black spaces in your life. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, when I came, I was about seven, but you have to realize that I came from a, an institution, unlike Lisa, First of all, I came 10 years before Lisa. Um, and at that time, it was more acceptable in the orphanage. Uh, Korea was economically distressed. Um, so very limited resources in terms of taking care of the children, especially mixed children. And I'm speaking about whites and, and blacks, just mixed children, period. Um, we, you know, you, and the method of raising children or taking care of children in orphanages, I think changed, has, well, has changed significantly over the years. There's no doubt about that. So you have to realize I pretty much came from a very sterile, cold, um, distant type of environment, it, very much of an institution. So when I came to this country, I did not speak any language none whatsoever. I couldn't understand anything. Only thing I knew were two songs and that was Charlie Brown and K Sera Sera. That was, that was it. And I had learned that um, in the barracks. Um, I'll enter school and I, you also have to remember, you know, 70 years ago, you're talking about over 60 years ago, Many people basically live within their community and they recognize only what they knew and saw in their communities. That, that, that was the way. And when I came, we were living in the housing projects over in Southeast Washington. And I entered the little school across the street and immediately the students recognized that I did not belong to the community, but um, I, you know, I didn't necessarily engage. Over the years, it was very visible to many of the African-American communities uh, that I, I came from someplace else. I had to have come from someplace else. So people would ask me. And I didn't have all the whereabouts and the wit. I, I was very busy in my early childhood just trying to get an education, trying to forge my way to um, getting an education because my speech 
wasn't very good. My language skills was pretty much, it, they weren't good at all, very limited. But fortunately, I could read mentally very well. And uh, also now you're coming towards the late 60s and 70s when we were very much having affirmations in the African-American community of um, identifying with our culture, uh, with the Afros and having a certain look. Then the issue came up that I didn't look black enough perhaps for, for my community. So that was, a, that was another period. But however, if you go into the, as people like to use the word space now, uh, if you go to the white spaces, they knew that you were black. So that was that. Then for some African-Americans, if you obtain certain goals and objectives, you got that because you were light skin and long hair type of thing, which I was not. I mean, you know, I grew up in a situation that I didn't know anything about that. But anyway, that was that was brought back. And I noticed that that was even to my professional career, such as having the opportunity to join um, uh, professional organizations and having leadership roles, uh, my counterparts would say, you got that because you know you, you don't look black. You, you don't look like the hardcore black person. So that, that type of thing. But anyway, um, as I entered college, I really wanted to know a little bit more about Korea. I, I was independent. I was out of my out of my house, so to speak, my family's house, and I could do what I wanted to do with my time. However, when I reached out to the Koreans, I then realized that they were not accepting of me. And of course, not having any language skills, I couldn't speak any Korean. Uh, that wasn't helping the situation. So one church that I went to, they gave me a Bible in Korea and pretty much scooted me out the door. And that was that. Was that. Um, but I think that um, I've been very fortunate that perhaps living in an orphanage during that period of time helped me become very resilient. And I, I never really had to worry about getting approval of other people. I was able to forge ahead. And at some point in early in my life in junior high school, I realized that education was very critical for my future. So that's what I spent most of my time doing is, is to just study and forge ahead with my own aspirations and not worry too much about the African-American community or anything else in that sense of whether or not they accepted me or not. But now we have so many uh, mixed children and um, that it's, it's much more acceptable now. So the way I look has become more acceptable and is now the fashion of the day, so to speak. So I fit right in now. I did when I was a little child, but I fit right in. Lisa? Um, yes, uh, and I, I totally agree um, with everything Estelle said. Um, Yes, Estelle and I came to the United States um, uh, about 10 years apart. Um, our stories differ a little bit, but they mirror a lot of the things. Um, and I have to say, Corey, everything that you said, um, I mean, you and I could spend hours together and everything that you have researched, I can tell you how it is so true. It is so, um, that is so based on fact um, about our fathers being sent to these places. Uh, my father, and we have since um, found out, uh, but my father was sent to Korea uh, and I was born in 1962. He was very much in love with my mother, but when it was found out that my mother was pregnant, he was sent right away, right away, moved off the base, get out of here. And my mother said she saw him one day and she never saw him again. I have since found out that my father wanted to marry her and bring her to the United States. 
but I can only assume that the military was not, um, was not in favor of that. He was then sent to Germany. Um, this is now 1963, where I have a German sister somewhere in the world that I hope one day the Lord will allow me to. I have found out that she was born in 1964 in Bamberg. So, and, and he was able to adopt her and bring her to the United States. Um, but he, I have now since found out, um, he always said he had a child in Korea, but was not allowed to come and get me, contrary to what I was told growing up. Um, he then went to Vietnam, as you say, Corey, and my brother was born in 1971. I found out about him only three years ago. At 49, I found my brother through DNA. But uh, all the things that you said, sending these military soldiers, and every time that they would try to have a relationship, send them right away because that's not what they wanted. Um, um, and now getting back to the question about being black and Korean, um, my, my mom and dad um, adopted my sister and I because they had a very difficult time. They could not, they could not have children on their own. Um, and so they wanted children. In the United States, it was very difficult for that black family, though they were together and was man and wife for all of their entire life together it was very difficult for them to adopt children in the US, which is why when my dad was in Korea, it occurred, uh, I'm sure through uh, now knowing that they were advertising little kids for sale, basically, um, little orphans for you is how it was worded um, in, in all these different magazines is how my mom and dad decided that they wanted to have, okay, well, we'll take some too. And they wanted two. And so that's how we came to the United States um, because we were black and Korean, but this was a black family that we were being adopted into. We were um, taught to be black, but just as Estelle said, in around black friends, I was not black enough. Okay, you're not black, you're Chinese. No, I'm not Chinese at all, I'm Korean, but I wasn't black enough. Um, we did live on a military base because my daddy was in the military all the way till I grew up. Um, but with any Asian friends, girl, you're not Asian. I wasn't Asian enough. And so um, just as Estelle said, you know what then you have to do? You just have to be the best person that you can be. I'm not black enough. I'm not Korean enough. And so growing up, it's, um, it's hard to find an identity because where do you fit in? Where are you? You're this person who does not have an identity. You know, my mom and dad raised us. We ate food, typical black American, but Southern food. We did typical black uh, family things, but going to my grandmother's house, they was not, we was not black babies. We was not my grandma, adopted grandma's black babies. Um, we was little Korean babies. And that's what they used to say. Well, John, come on right over here and bring your Korean babies. But around other Korean people in on base, we couldn't speak Korean. So those are black kids. So it was it's very difficult um, growing up. And yes, uh, now there's so many people who are, who are, um, mixed and who are multicultural, multi-heritage. But back in 1960s, and I'm sure for Estelle, back in the early 60s, it was not so. Mm -hmm. in, in, 19, in 1969, when we came to this country, and I did speak, of course, I spoke Korean, and being with my dad, he taught me how to say mama, he taught me how to say different things, and we learned Kumbaya, that's the only, uh, uh, because the American soldiers used to come and they teach us Kumbaya. Um, so we knew those, um, those kinds of songs. 
But when I came to this country, my sister and I, my mother was so happy she had two little girls. So I was, I was almost seven and my sister was four. So she took us on play dates, but we couldn't speak English with the other little kids at this play date, at this military base play date. And I remember the first word that I can remember in English was stupid. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what stupid meant, but I remember her saying stupid. And when I did learn to speak English, it dawned on me because that stayed with me. That stayed with me. And here I am, I'll be 60 years old this year. I remember that in, from 1969, that little girl on a play date saying that me and my sister were stupid. So yeah, it's, it was very well-meaning of the black soldiers to try to adopt um, the black children. And I'm thankful, I'm thankful by all means that my, that my mom and dad got us, I'm thankful. But let me tell you something, it wasn't an easy road. It wasn't an easy life. Because as a child, you need to fit in. I have six kids, I have grandkids, and it's important to fit in. And that's the one thing I will tell you. And I know with other adoptees, whether they're white mixed Korean adoptees, black fitting in was something that we didn't do as little kids. But you, you cover that up, you compensate by getting into your books. Because if I don't fit in any other way, I'm gonna be the smartest kid in class. If I don't fit in any other way, I'm gonna get the best A's. And so that's where I'm gonna be. And that's how I live my life. And I know that's how Estelle lived her life too, being in the books because, oh, I mean, yeah, friendship was important to me, but making sure that I, I did the grade so that I could, I could fit in somewhere. So I don't want to ramble, but that's um, that's that's um, how it was. Lisa, thank you so much for sharing that story. <clears throat> um, I really I really appreciate you your willing your bravery in, in telling your story tonight. Um, Corey, I wanted to I just want to briefly ask you you know after we've heard from these experiences from Lisa and Estelle. Um, did you, in your research, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of the experience of Black families in the 50s and 60s who are going through this adoption process. I mean, yes. um, you know, Lisa talked about how her family was, didn't really have a lot of options adopting in the United States. Um, and I, so could you just talk kind of briefly about that? Absolutely. And Deanne, will you just in the chat let me know, is that a better sound? Dan noticed that I was cracking up a little bit. Yes, that's better. Wonderful, thank you. Um, the families who adopted found, families who attempted to adopt in the United States ran up against a number of obstacles. The US adoption system evolved as a system to accommodate white relinquishing mothers and white adoptive families. So most of the agencies, and this isn't all of the agencies, but the majority of adoption agencies were not prepared to work with African-American families or inclined to work with African-American families. The policies that they established, the ways that they screened families were designed to replicate an idealized white family. And what that meant was they could screen and among the applicants, uh, the white applicants they received, there were working class whites who attempted to adopt, but they could screen them out because there were so many middle-class and upper-class white families who wanted to adopt. For African-Americans, the legacies of segregation, slavery, going, you know, all of it, meant that economically, even sort of these so-called best families among African-Americans were often unable to meet those requirements. So for example, some of the base requirements were things like they needed to be younger than, I think the age I saw most often was like 40. 
They needed to own their own home and have a separate bedroom. They needed to have an income. The husband had to have an income and savings. Wives were supposed to stay home. And so for most African-American families, those requirements made adoption out of reach. But it was also the institutionalization of racism and racism in these child welfare agencies that meant that they really were up against a number of real barriers to adoption. For families, this meant that Black families would adopt with agencies that were known as independent agencies. And this happened both in the U.S. context, so adoptions of children in the U.S., but also adoptions involving children, the transnational adoptions. The families who adopted transnationally, who weren't affiliated, so there's two things that really do come through. Military families and people who were affiliated with knew a soldier, a large part of their awareness of and motivation to adopt grew out of those connections. For non-military families, they often, chose transnational Korean in, in the case uh, that we're speaking of tonight because they were prohibited from adopting in the US. Uh, I ran across a number of the case notes where black families would say to agencies in the US, if you don't approve this adoption, I'm gonna work with say Harry Holt, who was known, um, who is known, he, it's, it's a very unfortunate, um, He's known as the father of Korean adoption, and that's a, a bigger story than we can tell tonight. But they would say, I will work with Harry Holt. And they would say that they're gonna work with a different agency where they felt that they would have a better chance of being approved for adoption. Because yes, the barriers in the United States based on largely on institutional racism, but also on economic, uh, sort of that economic inequality that was a product of uh, these racist systems, these segregated systems meant that Yes, much like Lisa's parents, they were looking to other ways to build their families. Thanks, Corey. So we are kind of getting down to the end of our time and I'm, I just wanna go around and ask each of you if you have, uh, if you have just a, anything that you wanted to bring up um, or say to, the, to our audience before we have to close it down for the night. I'm gonna start with you, Estelle. Do you have any kind of closing thoughts or parting thoughts that you would like to share with folks? Yes, well, first of all, I wanna thank my children and I just wanna thank the audience and to the members of the panel and especially for Deanne to bring this story to light, to be able to document something for history. Also, I think that we've discussed it over and over again tonight, this evening, it's been emphasized. I do want the uh, people in this country to recognize that in spite of the barriers, proportionally, African-American soldiers did adopt many of the children of color. And not only did they adopt once, kind of like in Lisa's case, I know of many cases or several cases in which they adopted several children, several Korean children. And the adoption, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to just speak about the Korean War. You have to also look at our involvement with Germany, how German children, the Black children of Germany actually fared a lot better than the ones from Korea, of course, we're talking about a different time. But I think I would like for the public to recognize that, especially now when we look at blended or admixture, to realize that African-American individuals in this country and really all over the world, we are the most admixture group of people that you can think of. I mean, you can just imagine. And um, that we must recognize the, in spite of the barriers, many African-American soldiers did adopt these children very early on. And I was adopted in uh, at least 10 years before Lisa. Thanks, Estelle. Lisa, do you have any parting thoughts that you wanna leave with our audience? Um, yes, well, um, once again, I just wanna say thank you so very much to 
um, to you, um, Kim. Thank you so much to Miss Corey and um, Estelle. You know how much I love and adore you. Um, uh, I know that um, Deanne has just been so amazing in documenting our stories. I thank you so very much for allowing the world to know um, our stories. Um, I know that I saw Min Young Kim on earlier too. She may still be on. Uh, Min Young um, uh, has uh, Me and Korea, which Steven is um, a part of. And um, that's how we went to Korea to really go delve deeper into my, um, to my story, to our stories. Um, I will say that many of us, many of us were told here in the US stories that were not true. Many of us were told things about ourselves that were not true. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity that we did get to go to Korea and delve into our culture. That was something that was taken away from us. Our culture was taken away from us. Um, it's not until recently since our trip to Korea that I've gotten to appreciate it because we were told, uh, as, as I've said before, that we were black children, just ignore all the rest of it. But we really are part of two great communities. And so um, I appreciate being able to, um, to understand who I am fully, to understand that the pain that we went through made us the people that we are. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm thankful for uh, 325 Karma, who's, mm -hmm. um, who some members are on tonight, because through DNA, through Mr. Uh, Thomas Clint, Clement, who, um, who have allowed us with Family Tree DNA, that's how I found my brother. Um, I always felt, and I love and adore my sister, my adopted sister, but I always felt that there was someone else out there. And thanks to, thanks to DNA, and I hope that everyone will get a chance to do some sort of testing if you have not. Um, thanks to DNA, I was able to find my brother who I adore and we have a fantastic relationship. He is the other part of me that I was missing. You know, so he's Vietnamese and black and I'm Korean and black, but to look at us, we look the same. We look the same. And so I just, I, I thank you. I appreciate you. Uh, Deanne, you know, I love you beyond words. And I hope that everyone will tune in to um, the film. It is fantastic. Um, the stories um, are amazing. And each of us, even though we, um, we have, our stories are a little bit different the similarities are so there. And I thank you, Corey, for really um, touching on some of the things that our parents had to go through. Some of, the, some of the fights, it took my mom and dad a year to get us to this country, a year. And the amount of monies that they had to put, put through to get us here, but they got us here and I'm thankful. I'm thankful to be here and I'm thankful to be um, a part of both great communities, Korea and the US. Thank you so much, Lisa. Corey, do you have any parting thoughts that you wanna share with us? The only thing I wanna say is thank you all. This has been a pleasure to the panelists, to my co-panelists. Your stories are the stories that we need to hear now. Scholars have um, done that work that we do, but in truth, the work now is a work of hearing mm -hmm. and responding to the questions that you have. So please let us know what we can provide. The last thing I will say is um, you said pieces and the last document, and this is not a stretch, the last document I looked at for this project when I was doing my original research was a letter from a woman, Korean black adoptee. And she said, my life is like a picture puzzle. She said, I've had a good life and I, I love my family. My, family in the States, but my life is like a picture puzzle with many important pieces missing. And her goal was to find those pieces. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Estelle. Thank you, Deanne. And thank you, Kim. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Corey. Deanne, would you like to, would you like to close us out or give us any parting thoughts? 
Um, I just feel like we're just getting started and we have to leave, but um, I could go on for another two hours, but I know people, <laughs> I promised that it would be one hour, um, but thank you so much, um, uh, everybody, just uh, very touching stories, I'm, I'm, I'm very moved, and I love the idea of being our full selves, um, and um, I hope that we can all go forward this evening, be our full selves, and um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much to everybody who uh, tuned in tonight and listened to our conversation. Um, we appreciate you and part of our community. Thank you, Chris Hastings and everybody at the World Channel, um, everybody who participated in tonight's, uh, in tonight's conversation, all of our many sponsors who I believe are gonna be named in the chat um, if they haven't been already. Uh, and especially to my esteemed panelists um, and co-panelists today on the, on the panel, um, Corey Graves, Dr. Corey Graves, Dr. Estelle Cook-Sampson, uh, Lisa Jackson, of course, um, of course, the indomitable Dion Borchay Lim. Uh, as a Korean adoptee, um, I feel so much, I, I, have, I feel I have so much in common with the stories that you told tonight, and I'm really delighted to, uh, to meet you all and talk with you all online tonight. Um, thank you so much. Please tune in to Geographies of Kinship um, on Thursday. Thank you.